This video contains the names of parts of the human anatomy. Viewer discretion is advised. If you are experiencing problems or pain connected with your voice, please seek help from a medical professional. Not this video of two pipsy people on the internet. <laughs> mum doesn't like these videos. I'm sorry, mum, but Does she not? they're fun. No, she doesn't like the whole drinking thing. Oh, screw <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. You know oh, what time you. it is. Big Ted is back. It's the magical. We're back. Beverages are back. First collab of 2021! <laughs> We're doing another collab. We're doing another Drunken Explain. So on Josh's channel, straight after this, he's going to be explaining to me... Age of Sigma. And today, I'm going to be explaining to him how singing works. The mechanics of it, why things sound the way they sound. So if you are interested in singing, you'll get a little Singing 101 Still Anatomy crash course as well. Before we get started, show of the week is Josh's pick. You're in town. You're in town. Mm -hmm. I saw that in town. Me um, too. In London town, not you're in town. Yeah, not in, not in your in town. Very fun show, very unusual show. So I will leave a link to cast recordings below so you can check it out. Yeah. Let's talk about singing. Woo! Right. So Josh, what do you know about singing? It's a noise that you're that some people can make very nicely. Mm -hmm. Some people can't make quite as nicely. Mm -hmm. Some people can't make it at all, and other people can't make it at all, and yet they're still famous for doing it. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm going to explain to you. I'm, uh, I'm, well, I'm... Let's start with the basics, shall we? Basic 101, you have three main parts of the voice. So you've got your lungs, which are like here. It just looks like I'm showing you my breasts. But no. <laughs> but yeah, so you've got, I'm not complaining. You've got your diaphragm, yep. which is inside you, and you cannot feel your diaphragm. Yes, there are lots of exercises where you like pant and stuff, but you cannot feel your diaphragm. They say you can move your diaphragm, but you can't yeah. physically feel the movement, or you can't feel where it is. You can't feel where it is. Okay. So you can feel where your diaphragm connects to other muscles that you can feel. So like if you do, do this, do this. So if you find the bottom of your ribs, mm -hmm. I'm going to kneel up just so the camera can see what I'm doing. So if you feel the bottom of your ribs here, Mm -hmm. And then you walk them in to where they like dip up and then you've got your sternum here. Oh yeah. And then if you go <laughs> You can feel that kicking out. Yeah. So that's one of the places where your diaphragm connects. <laughs> cool. But what you're feeling there is not your diaphragm. Okay, that's just muscle. Yeah, it's just tendon. it's just it's just muscle. Singing is completely muscular, so anyone can learn to sing. Is that a science thing or is that like a rhetorical thing? No, 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 that's a science that's a science thing. Oh, cool. It's it's just a muscular thing. And obviously there are some people who are naturally better at it when they're kids or whatever than others, mm. which is what you might call an indication to natural talent. But anyone can learn to do it because you just develop the muscles like anyone can learn to run yes there are some people who are good at running when they're kids and some people who are shite yeah, at running okay, not but anyone, anyone can, can learn. learn not anyone can learn to run <laughs> if you have if you have Hashtag working legs <laughs> hey at least i'm not seeing and just completely ignoring the autistic community with my passion project film oh yeah but, oh yeah mm. that old chestnut that's a thing that's she's currently a, happening as we're filming this she's a bad dude hashtag cancel it's Josh. just like you don't have to double down just be like i'm sorry i didn't listen i will do better next time and everyone would have been like cool thanks see ya the doubling down is just making it worse and it's just woman stop I agree. anyway it's just woman <laughs> woman stop. cease cease and desist so you have your diaphragm you have your lungs the diaphragm is what causes the change in space in your lungs to force air in and out changing mm. the air pressure and the airflow and then obviously you've got your larynx which is in your throat the uh, vocal folds or vocal cords is where the sound is actually made and then you have your pharynx which is basically the whole thing from like here into like your mouth Wait, like so like your pharynx yes yeah, so you have so that's your... not like the larynx no 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 okay. the larynx is literally just your larynx the pharynx is the whole tubular system so it includes your throat it includes your mouth it includes your nose all of the spaces in your face thank you i now have a new word for word association games and people are going to tell me i'm making it up that is like the basic bitch of singing in terms of all of the compartments and then the basic bitch of explanation of what physically happens is air comes up from your lungs goes through your vocal folds your vocal folds end up like vibrating so if that's your vocal folds you're looking down so like your head is here looking down your throat the air forces the vocal folds to go in and out like that okay so i'm like getting here because i like wasn't sure what direction oh, okay like that cool and for the camera like that like that 
that creates the vibrations in the air which makes the sound and then that sound is modified in your pharynx in, by your mouth and your teeth and your lips and all of that stuff to make sound and words. Cool. I like it how there's so much biology involved. I mean obviously there's yeah. lots of biology involved. Well see thing, but... see this is this is the thing because for some people the biology is really really helpful and that's where it still comes in. Boom. So there was this singer called Joa Still. She did she get nodules or did something happen with her voice? I can't remember. Leave it in the comments below. Yeah, let me know what Still did in the comments. And whilst you're down but, there, uh, I can subscribe and click the bell button. Click the bell button. I clicked the bell button once. Now he won't stop calling me. Is that Alexander Graham Bell? Way Nerds! So, Joe Still was this opera singer. She, for some reason, I don't know if something happened or if she was just like mad interested, she just really wanted to know physically what the heck was going on in people's voices. Because before then it was just like, oh, think of rainbows. So she did lots of stuff to learn about the mechanics of what goes on in the voice. And she came up with the different names for the different voice qualities. You've got sob, cry, twang, belt. I feel like there's another one. Caffeine free. No. Can't remember what the other one is. And basically the physical things that are happening when you do those. For some people that's really really helpful but because the changes are so small and kind of can be counterintuitive and there's so many different things going on for other people, they prefer having those um, kind of more visualization type instructions. For example, things like imagine you're singing out the back of your head. Imagine that your your neck is getting wider. Imagine that you're really, really laughing. You're finding this hilarious while you sing to make the physical changes happen because that's easier to understand than retract your false vocal folds, you know? I see um, how that makes sense, actually. Because I yeah. suppose you feel the resonance, even just talking, I feel it. Mm. all through your head so say it almost feels like it was like just being specific as to where you want the resonance to come from in a yeah way. it's not so much about resonance it's about those things cause muscular changes in your larynx cool so let's talk about that oh no i need to talk about the different parts of the larynx before i can talk about belt and cry and stuff so in your larynx you have the hyoid bone fun fact only bone not attached to any other bone in the human body it's completely flying free, man. Just like, hey, I'm the hyoid bone. I'm just hanging out, chilling. Hyoid! Meow, meow, meow. I assume. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what it does. So the hyoid bone is where your tongue root attaches. So you've got your, you've got your mouth here, you've got your tongue, tongue root, hyoid bone is just like there. Then you've got the thyroid cartilage, I think. The thy Shall I get up a diagram? It has been a lot. I will, you know what? I will edit in a diagram for you guys. I, it's been a while since yeah, I learned about the anatomy of the <laughs> They've got the thyroid cartilage, which I think it supports the vocal folds in some way. But basically that tilts forward and back. That's all you need to know. Okay. <laughs> Then you've got the true vocal folds. I think the true vocal folds are either within the thyroid cartilage or underneath the thyroid cartilage. I can't remember exactly where they are, but the true vocal folds are the thing that make noise. We love the true vocal folds. They're great, banging. You also have the false vocal folds that like to try and help out, but they're kind of, they're kind of like, what's the name of a character in a film or a show that's like trying to help but makes everything worse? They're kind of like Baldrick. <laughs> the, <laughs> the false vocal folds are kind of like Baldrick in Black Adam. Can call them Baldrick folds then? We can call them Baldrick folds if you want. But I like, have a cunning plan to make have, you a better singer. They have a cunning plan, the cunning plan is shite and they just make everything wrong and we have to kind of like get them out of the way sometimes or like trick them into doing what they should be doing. Then you have the cryoid cartilage which is underneath the thyroid cartilage. So I think it's like, when we did it at school, they were like, yeah. right, put your hands like that. Yeah. So that's like the cryoid. And then like the hyoid was like above it like this. It looks a bit like a vagina, it's not. Double vagina. Double vagina. <laughs> Double vagina. Double. <laughs> Triple vagina. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, but literally the diagram, especially if you're looking from above, it does look a lot like a vagina. It's just a big fleshy triangle. Um, just like a vagina. Just like a vagina. Um, 
say the crime. <laughs> the time's only gonna say vagina in this video. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop. Right? <laughs> so the cryoid cartilage tilts up. So the thyroid tilts forward, the cryoid kind of fil tilts up, if I remember right. Do they come into contact when they tilt, or do they stay apart? Just to have interest. Mate, they did not cover that. <laughs> <laughs> So they just tell you what they I, do, but not what happens yeah. what they do is just, oh, it opens and it works. Do they touch each other? Oh, who knows? We stop I think, maybe, I think maybe they might touch each other slightly, but it's not like they're like, like that. Uh, <laughs> like what, sorry? <laughs> so one more time? No. <laughs> so those are all of the bits that make up the larynx. And then the larynx itself can move up and down a certain amount. Okay. If the larynx moves up, it gets higher. As it moves down, it gets lower. Also, it, the larynx moving slightly up or down relatively can have an effect on the vocal quality. So it might not be enough to like change the note you're singing, but it can make it, you know, different, which we're going to gotcha. get to in a second. Exactly. Before I get onto vocal qualities, let's talk about thin folds, thick folds, everything. As a rule of thumb, the thinner your vocal folds are, the quieter the sound. The thicker the vocal folds are, the louder the sound. Depending on the amount of air that's going through, your folds need to be thinner or thicker. If too much air is coming up and your folds aren't thick enough to make full closure, that's when you get air coming through and that's where you eventually get things like nodules if you don't fix it. If your folds are too thick and the, there isn't enough air to push them apart, just no sound will come out. That's basically it. Oh, and whispering is when your folds are completely apart and it's literally just the air and your, you know, tongue, lips and teeth making the sound. There is no, there's no voice sound. And yeah, that's when you're whispering. Yeah, that's when you're whispering. That's actually quite cool. And you can whisper really, really loudly, but it's really hard. I guess you're right. Yeah. Like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hear about the vocal qualities? I think we're finally there. Okay, yes, but I'm, I'm enjoying this. This is actually really informative. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'm glad. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the two Drunk and explains it before this one, but they were like, one was like a really old school musical with like, you know, singing our way from the Nazis. And <laughs> what was the other one? Oh yeah, chess. <laughs> that pretty much sums up chess, doesn't it? So, what was the other one? Right. <laughs> so, vocal qualities. The first vocal quality is cry. Yeah. So cry is when you tilt your thyroid cartilage forwards, it thins out the vocal folds and you get a very nice, smooth legato if you want to go for that tone. It's a very singy tone. Yeah, I'm having some amaretto. You have some amaretto. So it's a very singy tone. Yeah. So the way to demonstrate cry is when you whimper like a dog really, really high. So like, that's, that's cry. It's okay. probably really bad because I've had alcohol, but yeah. Do you want to have a go? Okay, so try and, try and, I feel like your folds weren't completely together at the start of that. There we go. So that's, so that's cry. So that's, that's a way to practice cry, like getting used to that kind of vocal quality. Okay. And that is used a lot in more legit musical theatre, not necessarily like old school musical theatre, but songs where you need more lines, so you'd be using that in Sondheim, yeah, Adam so Gettle. It's not, it's not, it's not a speak. No, those... you would use it in the Rosalind Would you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, no, you would. You, you would. would. You it's would. not a speech quality sound. Would you be using it a lot during um, sung through musicals? Depends on the style of the sung through musical, because like Hamilton, for example, is basically sung through, mm. but because of the style of music, you're going to be looking at more speech quality, more twang, more bells. There's a lot more rapping it for one thing. Yeah. There'll be times where you might want to tip into cry to give it that line especially with things like the runs to make them nice and smooth yeah. but by and large because of the style of the music you would not be using cry quality you'd be using more speech quality i think speech quality might be the <laughs> might be the voice quality that i forgot at when i first mentioned them the second quality is sob so sob is like cry in that you tilt your thyroid forward but you also lower your larynx a little bit. So that's what I meant about lowering your larynx doesn't necessarily change the pitch, it also changes the quality. What was the thing we practiced for practicing song? Mm. Oh, I think it was just that. It was like, mm. Mm. Yeah, it's basically like pretending that you're crying like an old lady. Where's the head? A bit lower then, we'd be like, Where's the head? 
kind of like a sad yeah. ghost. So sob mixed with twang is what is used in opera. So you have that really kind of low, really tilted, lots of vib sound. But to make it ping over the orchestra, you need twang. Mm. Oh, I haven't mentioned uh, one bit that's to do with the the thing that is in your throat, larynx. <laughs> Thing we've been talking about the thing us. we've been talking about. I don't know exactly where this is, but there's a thing called the epiglottic sphincter. And I think... It's, it's called the sphincter, so I feel like... It's in your throat. Wait, you have a butthole in your throat? Sphincter just means circular muscle. Oh. oh. Your iris is a sphincter, Josh. Ew! The epiglottic sphincter. Yep. And it tightens and loosens and when it tightens you get twang. Twang makes things ping essentially. Also twang makes voices tend to sound the same. If you have two singers that use a lot of twang you probably think their voices sound very similar. It kind of homogenizes, it kind of homogenizes quality. Does it? Yeah. What were you gonna ask me? Does that um, negate pitch a little bit as well? Absolutely not. There are pitches where twang is easier, but you can twang at any, like, if I'm down here, I can be like, wah, 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 wah. that's a low twang. Wah, 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 wah. That's high twang. Cool. You practice twang by quacking like a duck. Uh, um, is this like when you did them, what you want to do in the style Yeah, style exactly. Of that's, that's why, that's why. So obviously in that video, I was exaggerating the twang. You, you mix twang with other qualities so it doesn't just sound like Donald Duck. Yeah. But, that's how you practice it. You quack like a duck. You can also like twang like a banjo or another similarly um, twangy instrument. Cool. As a side note, that was her vlog video. And if you've not seen that, then you should watch it. It's a good video. You should just be my PR person. <laughs> the the other thing you can do if you don't want to quack like a duck or twang like a banjo is um, cackle like a witch. Like, <laughs> that is also twang. Like an elf in alphabet, you're basically twanging half the time you're on stage. Oh yeah, alpha, the part of alphabet uses so much twang, so much. The fourth vocal quality is speech quality. Speech quality, you've got thick folds, but you're quite low in the speechy part of your range. Gotcha. So when we speak, we're in speech quality. You can bring that into vocal qualities. So for example, what's a song that uses speech quality that I know? Oh, everything's gone out of my head, obviously. You got me out of my head. Um, do any of the Come From Away songs use it? Oh yes, actually. So kind of um, the beginning of the one that I sing all the time. My parents uh, must have me and the sky. Me and the sky. So the beginning of me and the sky is a little bit speech quality, depending on obviously naturally where your range is, but it's fairly low. You're looking, you're around like a C, middle C. So my parents must have thought they had a crazy kid. It sounds pretty much like my voice. I'm just talking on pitch, yeah. essentially. It is a great song. Though, is that no? It's a that song. So that's what speech quality is. It's great if you're singing stuff that's really in that speech part of your range. That's what it's used for. And also you can use it to make songs seem more conversational. So if you've got, um, oh my God, I'm an idiot. What's the name of it when you're like, the bits that are in between like big numbers in opera? Uh, you've, got, I, you've got arias and then you've got I don't know what something but I, I mean like the bits like in like in Les Mis where he's just like we have those random bits where they're just like chatting but they're singing like that's when you'd use like a speechy speech quality oh, okay. thing going on you know Ooh. so the last speech quality is belt and belt is the one that arguably is the most dangerous because when you're using tilt of your thyroid cartilage that's a very safe way to sing assuming that you've got correct airflow and air pressure you're not pushing air or anything like that whereas basically with bell what you're doing is you're taking thick folds that you'd have in speech quality and taking them up up in your range now naturally when we go up in our range we thin out our vocal folds apart from babies babies are the og belters so belting is natural babies do it <laughs> But as we get older, because most of us don't need to like shout all the time, Why we lose. That? What do you mean? 
I find myself shouting frequently. No, but like when you're a child, like we, in most cultures, I think children are taught not to, not to shout, not to be too loud, you know, inside voices, all of that stuff. So you can lose your ability to belt safely unless you're doing it out of reflex. It's a very, very loud, very powerful sound. If you need to shout, that's how you shout. You're using belt, essentially. Um, and that's the way our voice teacher taught us to belt was basically yelling, going, yeah! And I said, that, that wasn't belt because I'm not belting two, three units of Disarono down. I'm not doing that. No, yes. that's terrible for your voice. Exactly. Though, why is it called belting? I don't actually know why they say belt. I think it's probably from a colloquialism in performance where people would say to belt it out. Okay. I imagine maybe it's something to do with that. I mean, bearing in mind this system that is still devised came out in, I want to say the 80s or 90s. It was very, very recent and people have been uh, singing for centuries. Yes. Like Ethel Merman was belting in the 20 and 20s and 30s before yes, we had was. these names of what is, what is actually physically happening in people's larynxes when That's they true. belt. Also, and also, you know, belt it, uh, belt it, from what I, the little I do understand and know of singing, singing isn't universal. So uh, from what I understand, our way of denoting sheet music, the way we write music in the Western world isn't necessarily the way they write it in Asia or in Africa, or the way they even well, yeah. understand it, which I find quite and it's And it's also the fact that like, if we were to listen to um, traditional music or world music, for example, and the way that those people sing, we, we probably would be thinking, oh, that's this voice quality, or that sounds like that voice quality, but for them, that's just how you sing. What these words to know is physically what's happening. So the physiology is no different, but whether you call, like, names for things is going from a Western side of things. So with belt, a lot of things are happening, but the main thing that's happening in your larynx is that your cryoid cartilage is now tilting. I believe that helps give it the stability to keep the folds thick as they raise up and stop yeah, maybe they do contact then, because I think it also stops the thyroid cartilage from tilting, because I think your thyroid tilts this way, and I'm pretty sure your cryoid tilts like that. So if your cryoid is underneath and going like this, then your thyroid above it can't go like this, I think. Okay. Don't quote me on that, I'm not a doctor, and it's been like so many years since I learned this. <laughs> but to me, I, I the way you're describing it, I mean, I'm not sitting here like working my muscles quite they're going, oh, that makes sense, but just thinking about when I talk. Yeah, you can't feel any of this happening, by the way. If you, yeah. like, you you feel it in how it- how do you know it, it's real? Because you, you feel, you, okay. When I, when I say you don't feel it, you don't feel it in like, like oh, that's just tilted. You feel it with everything else that's going on at, in like the kind of sound you're producing and, how it sounds, yes, but mostly how it feels in your body, which is a better indicator, to okay. be honest. But then, but Hela, how do you know it's real? No, how, how do we know if anything's real? So the important thing with belt is that you need to support your larynx whilst doing this, because because you're taking thick folds higher so you can push more air to make a louder sound because the more air is coming through your vocal folds, the louder the sound is going to be. So in order to make a loud sound higher, you need thick folds up, but that takes a lot of energy and you need a lot of support. So you have to use what is called anchoring. Other vocal qualities and depending on the difficulty of the song and stuff, you'll need to use anchoring, but belt, you always need to use anchoring. Some people need it more than others, some people need it less, some people have a natural affinity for belting and find it very, very easy to do it safely. Other people, they need a lot of support from external muscles. So you have head and neck anchoring, which is anchoring in the back of your neck and kind of, they say in your head, but I don't actually think the head does much to anchor. I think it's more your neck. I think because when you're practicing head and neck anchoring, you do things like if you ball up your fist, and then you push back on your forehead, but you're pushing against that pressure. And you can see, you can Ooh, literally see yeah, the you... muscles in my neck. That's head and neck anchoring. And then also- And actually weirdly enough, you feel a difference in vocal quality when you do Yeah, that. you do. It, it, Cause it's, it's engaging all of your neck muscles, yeah. which in turn support the muscles in your larynx that are moving stuff. And then the other type of anchoring that you need to use is torso anchoring. So that is, just turning around. Hello, it's my bum. Mm. But that is the muscles like in your shoulders here. So um, I'm gonna try and anchor. If you can just shuffle over a little bit. 
out of frame. You probably won't be able to see this actually with my top, but we'll see if you can. So Trying to point. Go, if I go like that, can you? If you look in the monitor, can you see the difference? This is me relaxing. Mm -hmm. This is me angry. Yep, I can see. Yeah. And all I'm doing is doing Spider-Man hands. That's my favorite. That's my favorite way of Spider anchoring Spider-Man hands. Spider hands. So basically, you're engaging your shoulder blades, and the action is kind of down. Singers, especially in concerts and stuff, where you don't have to worry what you, or parts where you don't have to worry what you're doing with your hands. Will do like a, you can come back into the frame now. Okay. Hi um, everyone. <laughs> um, I miss they'll, you. They'll do like a like that kind of motion where they're like ha, leaning back slightly engages those muscles as your body's trying to maintain its balance. If uh, singers have a microphone, they'll sometimes hold the microphone and lean back on it. That engages those muscles. Or you can do Spider-Man hands, which is just way fun. So you imagine you're Spider-Man and you've got um, spider web coming out of your wrists. I'm just imagining I'm shooting it straight at the wall. It's made contact. And then if you pull, because you're pulling against something, that engages the muscles. And then if you're in a concert, you just do it to the floor instead and no one knows what you're doing. I love it. And also you can pretend to be Spider-Man. So those are the five main vocal qualities. These qualities, sometimes you can just use the qualities on their own, or you can blend them. Like I already said, opera is a blend of sob and twang. Belt and twang is something that is in a lot of contemporary American musicals. I think, I don't know if it's still the case now, but when I was training, I remember people saying that like the training in the States was very much like belty twang was what they did. Obviously within a song, different moments in a song are gonna need different things. And that will depend on your interpretation as a performer, as well as, you know, the style of the song. So for example, one of the songs in my rep is I Have Myself A True Love. And there's two uh, top E flats, I think. And obviously those two high notes in that bit, you can choose to belt them, you can choose to sob them, you can choose to do a mix, depending on what effects you want and the story you want to tell. Because obviously, okay. if you belt something, that's more like a shout. Whereas if you sob something, that's more like a cry or like anguish. So the vocal quality can have an impact on how the audience perceives the story you're telling and your character's reaction like emotional reaction to it so that's the useful thing about vocal quality is it can really inform the okay. story you're telling that makes a lot um, of sense yeah also if you know about vocal qualities it's a good way to get over technical hiccups so for example i'm going to talk about women because obviously it's, it's my own experience and i haven't taught men in a very very long time for female voices there is a, a, a like a gap where it's kind of a little bit too high for speech quality to carry, but it's too low to start belting. That's where you wanna use twang, ladies. <laughs> Which is, if you've watched the vlog video, that's exactly the problem I was having, that transition. I think I was trying to tilt it, but the th problem with tilt and cry is you don't have the power because your vocal folds are thinner, so you can't be as loud because you can't push as much air. Do you see what I mean? I see what you mean. Entirely. It's all a balance of vocal fold thickness and airflow. I have two questions. Yes. The first one is when it comes to controlling your vocal cords, I know that obviously you can't feel them so you don't have like direct, you can't say, oh, that's pushing it. Well, you can, um, I imagine. Because when you shout, you feel it. But is there a way to modulate that immediately as you're doing it, or is that training? And the other question I had is in terms of like your breath, um, and obviously, you know, you run out of breath, you can't do it anymore. But is it one of those things where your lung capacity starts to increase the more you start to use it in such this way, or does it work? is it just use of breath becomes more economic? Second question first: your lung capacity does increase okay. if you if you sing or if you play a woodwind instrument or a brass instrument where you're blowing, your as you learn, your lung capacity does increase and your control of your lung capacity increases as well so the first question about breath control it is training this is where the whole this like is actually really fascinating i know that there's not been a lot of jokes in this one at all <laughs> but i am i am really interested in this i think you guys should be interested as well be interested i'm don't, interested don't antagonize the audience no I, I but keep, i honestly find it really interesting but if you if you guys have been singing since you were kids kids first singing class you'll probably do exercises where you like breathe in two three Four, hold two three four out two three four five six seven eight and like I you breathe <laughs> five six seven eight da, 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 da. I love how you get straight for hairspray as well. <laughs> that was not hairspray! Was it not? No, that was a chorus line, you oh, shit, yeah, it was. Yeah, so 
those kinds of exercises teach you how to be economic with the breath that you're that you're giving because obviously when you're singing you want to breathe at points that make sense usually that will be on punctuation of lyrics so in terms of breath control look and guys i know it's a good example of breath control i, I know imagine. it's exciting guys but please so in terms of like breath control yes you just practice being able to breathe in and make that breath last for as long as it needs to last. Mm. In terms of knowing when you're pushing air or not, you you learn when you're doing it in a way. Some indicators can be things like if you're going red in your face, like really, really red, that's a bad sign. That's probably like you're pushing air. Sometimes you can hear it, or if you have a singing teacher in a singing lesson, like my, my singing teacher yeah. has sometimes pointed out, oh, it sounds like you're not getting full closure there. If you're not getting full closure, there's too much air for however thick your vocal folds are. So that either means you have to thicken up your vocal folds or you need less air and this is like the big difference from me having sung all my life in choirs and doing singing lessons at home and things to learning at ram was especially in choirs everything was about the diaphragm so we're going back to this i remember being told to like pull in like physically pull in my stomach your stomach will naturally go in as you run out of air so don't worry about your stomach naturally going in but if you're literally like can you see here if I'm like <laughs> that's me actually pulling in my stomach muscles that's pushing air when I don't necessarily need to now it might be that when you're learning how to sing and you're learning how to control your air you do need to do a little bit of that but definitely when you get to you know the professional level like me you don't need to be physically using your abdominal muscles in order to control airflow that shouldn't be happening it's actually more about keeping like your lung cavity supported so rather than thinking about bringing everything in and pushing everything up and out sometimes i imagine it like you're, you're made of a scaffolding like there's a scaffolding around you and you're tr like obviously your stomach's naturally going in as you're running out of air but you're keeping the support there in your intercostal muscles in your ribs in your back and keeping that kind of stable frame to support your diaphragm and support your larynx in keeping the air flowing at a consistent rate if that makes sense and um, how do you feel now knowing about the anatomy of the voice and how it all works and stuff i feel informed for one great thing. <laughs> um i didn't realize i mean i knew it was complicated I knew it was technical i knew there was a lot of science going on um, both physics and biology, actually, weird enough. Uh, what's the blending of those two? Oh, the physics will come from the um, the frequency of the vocal vol vibrations and stuff. Yeah. But um, you don't really need to know that as a singer. And to be honest, I, what I will say is you don't need to know the entire physiology of the voice either. It'll, it'll, the, if you if you watching this being like, oh, I wish I'd known that. That makes things make so much more sense. Then you know maybe look for a teacher that does have an understanding of a still or has an understanding of you know physiologically what's going on or you can know you can do your own research you can find diagrams of yeah. like well, how, how it's all made up if you're like this is really confusing then don't worry about it i yes find all this incredibly fascinating it is is that the end of this video you tell me i think it's the end of this video cool should we do the outro okay do, 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 do. <laughs> maybe i could play the outro live <laughs> two seconds well but harvey's just there yeah, but Harvey's shit. No offense, Harvey. I'm s no, no, no. It's like I Harvey did a show with you. He Harvey, Harvey went with you all the way to St Albans. Harvey was there when you Harvey died. Harvey, Harvey, Harvey went to Cornwall with me. Harvey. I admit it, but exactly, I like got Layla, and Layla sounds a damn yes, sight better. Yes, Layla does sound better, but you know, come on, Layla, you're new. Harvey, he's he's put in the time. Okay. Did I? Oh, I did it in G. Oh. So, Five, six, seven, eight. So that's all we have time for for now, folks. So like, subscribe, and comment below. And stay tuned for more beauty from a UK perspective. Bye, friends. I have no idea how I'm going to edit that in.